So Julie and I decided to come down to the Allied Forces Museum. It's called the Allied Museum. Um, it's not near all that downtown area. It's not near where like the Berlin Wall's at. It's about uh, 40 minute uh, between a bus and a subway ride to get here. But it's free to get in, which, which is what we're interested in. You know, that's not what the main reason. But I hear it's a much better museum that goes from World War II into the Cold War than the Checkpoint Charlie Museum. So here's also an interesting thing. It looks like they have a, um, a DMZ exhibit too, which once again, those of that know me know that uh, served in Korea quite often. It's one of them in the Air Force at Osan Air Base. Uh, hold on. So this is interesting because it has, it makes sense. It says the DMZ, uh, the last Cold War frontier. Yep. And I've been there. I've been in those UN buildings. So it closes at six. We're going to have about three hours. But honestly, no matter how much I love the museum, it, um, I only got about two hours in me. And then there's our bear. But uh, I'm going to stop it for now. I think this might have been a base. I think this might have been one of the post or base theaters when uh, the U.S. was here. So we keep finding these bears all over Berlin. But here's the interesting thing is that this one is representative of the candy bomber. Huh. So this museum is based in an old um, U.S. military base or post uh, installation theater. Here's some um, flags of the time. And then if you look at the U.S. one, 14 star flag. But I don't know if I filmed it already, but you come inside the theater and they have... Oh, Julie just found this. Once a movie theater and a library for the American occupying troops, now the Allied Museum here on the historic site will tell the story of the Western powers in Berlin, 1945 to 1994. Discover the exhibition, exhibition pieces, large and small, from uniform badges and an airlift plane. Cool. So there's another here cool thing. They got the original Checkpoint Charlie guardhouse is outside. So we're going to actually see the Checkpoint Charlie guardhouse that was there. All right. almost lost the phone. So they got these two wings. We haven't been into the main museum yet, but they got these two wings off to the side, which I'm imagining probably were bathrooms at one time. Oh, these are some of the same photos I saw in the prior museum just an hour or two ago. And that looks very familiar to me. I got one of each of those. A couple of them actually. I got a set of utensils, a couple of those, and one of those original ones. I don't have any of those. I wish I had one of these. It's a very well put together Jeep. Very nice Jeep. It's like a 19, 1909 Springfield, I'm not sure. I'm not really sure what the middle one is. <laughs> oh, well, here we go. M1 Grand, French rifle, and a British rifle. One thing that was interesting when I was serving, I saw this on one of the uniforms. Um, this looks like a French uniform. It's a French uniform. British uniform. But here's what's interesting is that the US forces that were here, if you were actually assigned to Berlin Brigade, 
two-star general. If you're part of the Berlin Brigade, Brigade up until 1989 when the wall went down, you were awarded a um, Omri of Occupation Medal. Hold on, let me see if one of these are them. No, that is just weird. What I was gonna mention was the Army of Occupation Medal, and this one actually is here. I can't believe this is actually here right when I started talking about it. And why I bring it up is because um, these that medal of Army of Occupation was initiated from World War II, tied directly to the Army of Occupation for uh, World War II. But if you served in Berlin, you were considered part of the Army of Occupation, and you could be um, a young, well, young at the time like me, and be awarded a World War II uh, medal all the way up to 1987 for being the Army of Occupation in Berlin. This shows the Berlin airlift. I've been reading a lot about this and finding out a lot about it on how they, um, when the Soviets started uh, blockading East Berlin, I'm sorry, West Berlin, West Berlin, they had an unbelievable logistical airlift that were flying. I think they said like a thousand planes a day would land in Berlin. If you don't know much about the Berlin airlift, you should look into it. Um, that's where that candy bomber thing came from. So these things here, this is, um, I don't want to say portable runways, but those are for makeshift runways as shown in this picture. We would see a lot of those um, in Egypt, but you'll also see that if you're from California, if you go down to um, Disney's uh, California, I forgot the name of that park now. The California Park, not the Disneyland Park, but the California Park. If you go there, they use this as a retaining wall at the Grizzly River Rapids. So I mentioned the candy bomber before. What, what this one pilot did is that when he would fly over um, from West Germany over East Germany to get back into West Berlin, he would drop parachutes with little candy bars on them to uh, um, probably ended up in the kids' hands in East Berlin, actually. Maybe. And it's like, hey, I mean, East Germany. But yeah, this is an example. Here's a kid that I found one. I'll read a little bit, I'll get back to you. So the recipients of the candy were actually uh, kids from West Berlin. They were outside the fence line of the airfield that he was landing in. I just heard this audio of his interview, which is really kind of cool. Um, this is him talking. Uh, is, is, uh, Halverson is his name. Um, I want to say his first name is Gail, but I'm not sure. Uh, Lieutenant Lieutenant Halverson. So, what's interesting is that the first thing he did was give some sticks of gum to them, but then uh, he started dropping these handkerchief parachutes with with candy bars. Well, it caught on back in the states, and donations from Hershey's um, schools started assembling the little parachutes. Uh, donations of chocolate started coming in because it was rationed. He couldn't get a lot of it, but it caught on really big. So, uh, candy bomber. If you look that up, you can get more information than what I'm giving you now. I just read something else that's really, really, really interesting. Um, there's a picture here. I'm going to turn it around. He was alive in 2019. He's passed away now, just in a handful of years ago. But here's a picture of him 
at a reunion in 2019. I find that quite unbelievable that he, he was alive in 2019. Um, he should be buried in Arlington. Who knows? Look him up. This looks like the radio station that was broadcasting. I'm not sure what art. I can't. I can't pronounce it. But R I A S is that. I guess that's the original neon right there. This is a uniform of a colonel that was in the Berlin district. But this is what caught my eye. He was a cavalry scout. Huh. Very interesting. He was a cavalry scout from World War II and was a colonel in Berlin. So what this was explaining is that when they delivered coal, coal was one of the main things they needed. They used U.S. duffel bags. Now this one feels more nylon, more of a Vietnam era. Here's a cotton one. This is something that I would imagine would have been more like it during World War II. The Brits used this one. This looks like a, like a gunny sack type of thing. But this is just a display of how they would transport coal, which coal was the main source of fuel, whether it be for powering um, machinery or, or heating a home. So that was one of the things that the airlift. And for one of the four powers being the Soviet Union to blockade transportation of necessities into West Berlin after all the agreements were signed was was pretty dastardly. But um, American ingenuity overcame it. A lot of the stuff in this museum is geared towards um, the Germans that live here. This museum wasn't really well known. I didn't, uh, I didn't know of it through research and it's not near anything else. But it seems like this is the type of place that um, Germans would come to to learn about the Allied involvement uh, at the end of World War II leading into the Cold War. Because everything I'm listening to is all in German. I don't see any other Americans here actually at all. <laughs> I'm standing in a historic American movie theater when the Americans were here. This is in the American sector. So just listen. Oh, so here's some really, really worthwhile exhibits out here. This is very interesting. So you got an airlift plane. Now, whether this plane was actually used in the airlift or not, let me, let me you got an air, well, let me just go through it. You got an airlift plane. You got one of the East German towers, which is remarkable, which is in the background of one of Julie's videos. You got a section of the Berlin Wall, and check this out. Right behind there, that is the original Checkpoint Charlie that is the original Checkpoint Charlie um, guard shack that was where we were just at. But I'm gonna, and I don't know, let me read about this train real quick and I'll tell you what that train car. That might have been the train car where they were, I think they did some signing of documentation on there. I don't know, let me read it. So one of the things I just read was, I guess there's a neon sign up there and it was called the Outpost but one of the things I just read was this was the biggest one in Berlin. And it was a combination of a stage and film they would show. And uh, they said, that kind of tells you the era when it was built, 19, 
1953 is when this outpost, when this when this theater becomes an operation. 1953, only U.S. personnel, troops, or families were allowed in. Um, Germans were only allowed in if they had a, a U.S. escort coming in. There must have been. I highly doubt that this was just here by itself. So there must have been um, some living quarters or something in the area. Oh, this is really interesting. Hastings TG503, um, from the time of the Berlin, comes from the time of the Berlin airlift, although this type of aircraft produced since May of 1946 was not in any way certified for use by the Air Force. It was already put into service in November 1948 for the airlift. So um, the Royal Air Force desperately needed airplanes. Um, the Hastings was the largest transport machine used by the Royal Air Force airlift based I can't pronounce it from there a total of 24 rubbed out can't read it Hastings flew 12,396 missions to Berlin um, now so this was a model that was this was a type of aircraft a roller craft that was used now was this physical aircraft used I, I can't confirm that so when I was in the Air Force as a um, 141 and C-17 medevac air crew member. We always told not to walk under the wings. <laughs> so what did I just do? I just walked under the wings. How did I walk under the wings? <laughs> I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get in trouble. <laughs> I walked in between propellers. Now in the army, I jumped out of C-130s, um, a C-130 propeller plane. But I've never crewed a propeller plane, <laughs> so I don't know if that's any different. Um, so yeah, that's <laughs> that's a no-no. I just did it. <laughs> So, of course, we went over the Berlin Wall a lot on this trip. Uh, one thing I didn't really plan out too clear, this, this round thing, this is what the East Germans put up. Uh, this round thing up here, they, they put up the whole wall. But what I was trying to explain that this round thing prevented people from climbing over. It made it harder for them to, to, to scale it. In fact, that's what they were trying to do. Um, the footings in the back are longer, like I said before. That would have been facing... Uh, towards East Berlin. Now this is a really good example of what you would see during the Cold War would be on one side on the East German side which is indicative of this demorama, this portrayal because there you have that and you have a East German guard tower there um, watching the wall. This longer section hold on Julie's got to show me something um, but real quick just wrap this up. See how, see how stark this is? The East Germans would not allow anybody to paint on that side but the West side they were so that's more indicative of what you would have seen during the Cold War. What Julie got was for one euro, she got us tickets to go inside the plane. Only till four. And we're walking through the, under the wings again. And we're not supposed to as our crew members. So let's, let's do some shots inside this plane. to the cockpit. <laughs> so it looks like a DC-3 or DC-4, but it's not. These look like supplementary O2. I'm not giving any presentations. Funny, I walked out and I was like, okay, here he comes, we'll talk about it. So this is one of the original uh, Checkpoint Charlie boots, but what Julie just picked up was, this one was actually used on that location from, so as you can tell, this one's a lot longer. This one's a lot longer than the um, ones that we were looking at. But this was used from 1986 to 1990. And in the movie, I keep referencing uh, Gotcha with um, Anthony Edwards, I think, was the actor. This is, what it, this is the one 
that looks more like the what you would have seen in the movie with Anthony Edwards. But this was actually at Checkpoint Charlie. This is the actual structure. So the ones that are smaller that we look at in the pictures and the ones that are there now, actually because of the way things were, those are so small. They were probably actually demolished and, and you know, just shredded and put someplace else. But let me go around a little bit. You get a good, get a good look at it. Well, it's pretty cool that they preserved it. So this is the other other thing I wanted to take a look at. There was a historic train where some documents were signed. You know, I just I, I don't know if this is what I'm thinking of. You know, what what, what these are? Um, these are just saying that these were the trains that were used after uh, World War II to get to and from um, East Ber West Berlin. Sorry, West Germany to West Berlin. And they're saying that some of them were modified and it was somewhat of a transport troop carrier type of, uh, not troop, no, yeah, I guess so, yeah. They moved military troops to and from, from West Germany into West Berlin. And this was one of those cars that was used. Not the last one, they said they were modernized after this. So, pretty interesting. So here's an interesting picture when they started putting up the first fence, the first border. You have these guys carrying some of the pillars that they're driving into the ground and lacing it with bob wire. So this was the first part of how they were building the wall. And then it just got more grandiose from there. Here's a depiction. I think that's Khrushchev. Khrushchev, I think. But that's Kennedy looking over the wall. Now that is one pristine... Jeep Willie. Wow. Well, this is nice. Whoever donated these uniforms, they have their pictures next to them. Oh, this is the original one from 1961, you guys. But Julie just read it, and it's only the facade, only the front. So that historic front that you see... It's right there. 1961. It's right there, and what we took a picture of is sitting in that spot, but it's not that building anymore. But that's... So there is some left from the first one. See if they did anything. No, they didn't put anything on the inside. Looks like they have some original signage here too. This is a pretty good portrayal or depiction. Um, the blue line is the outer perimeter of all of Berlin and the red line is the division through Berlin and that's why you can actually get to some of these points and feel like like checkpoint Charlie probably runs more north-south than east-west because of the way it turns there's a good marker right there you should know what that is by now I think checkpoint Charlie sits like right in there it's probably labeled in some kind but that's a pretty good table you know if you're going to spend any time here and try to research this this would be a good museum to start at So Julie just read up on this. This was actually a British spy tunnel, um, like a listening station. And they were tapping, I guess the tunnel went underneath the, into East Berlin. And I guess, um, here's, the, here's the operation, it's called Operation Gold. And apparently there was a double agent that told the Soviets that the tunnel was in existence. 
So I guess it got cut off, or I don't know what happened, but it got forgotten about, stopped being used. And then this museum dug it up and brought it here in 1987. Interesting. Um, maybe this is, map will show you how the tunnel ran. I think it was in that area at least.